All right, let's jump to John 15. Uh, we're going to look at 12 through 17 today. Um, a few chapters back, we, um, back in John 13, 34, Jesus gave his disciples a new command. That new command was in uh, chapter 13, verse 34, and it was to love one another. Now, in today's verse, we see Jesus expanding on this new commandment. He's going to provide a little bit more clarity on what it means to love one another. Um, so with this new command, Jesus completes kind of a three action, uh, through the three actions of love. Um, last week, we saw in verse 9, he said, As the Father has loved me, it's action one. So I have loved you. Action two. Action three today we're going to learn that Jesus calls us to love each other like the Father has loved him and how he has loved them. Step one, Father, Son. Step two, Son, Disciples. Step three, Disciples, Disciples. Does that make sense? That's how we are to love. So it's a divine love among the Trinity is the same love that God the Son has for his disciples and the same love that he calls us to have for one another. So in these verses, Jesus gives his disciples a command to love and then he gives a definition of love. Then he gives us the title of friend and then a definition of friend and then the process and purpose of Christ's love and friendship. Process, how, and then purpose of this love and friendship that we have that's of Christ. So I'll go ahead and read. Uh, let's read the whole section, and then we'll come back to 12 and 13. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. So go to... 12 and 13 here and look at the command to love and then the definition. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this that someone lay down his life. So notice the plural back in verse 10 was commandments. Commandments in verse 10. Now it's narrowed down here to a single commandment in verse 12. Love one another as I have loved you. So who's the one another? It's important, right? For being called to love one another, who's the one another? Well, in the immediate context, it would be the disciples among the disciples. Amen? That's who he's talking to. He's talking to the 11. You guys love each other. Uh, but, of course, the application then goes through them to us and to all believers. Amen? It doesn't just stop there. It's not a command that says, you 11 love each other, only you. All of the ones that uh, I convert by the message you'll proclaim, uh, it doesn't apply to them. Well, that's clearly not the case. So it applies to believers, towards believers. Not believers towards unbelievers. This is a different conversation. The conversation that we have before us is how believers are to interact with believers. Amen? Not believers with unbelievers. That's somewhere else in the scriptures. That's not today's conversation. Today's conversation is how is a Christian supposed to act towards another Christian? And by doing this, by saying, love one another as I have loved you, Christ did something in this world that has never been seen before. He has now identified a group of people by one thing, love. Throughout redemptive history, throughout the world, many groups in the world, have identified themselves in all kinds of different ways, by skin color, by neighborhood, by being a fan of a specific sports team, by abstaining from meat. 
whatever it may be. Those are identifying marks of a group of people. Jesus, for the first time, says the identifying mark of a group of people is love for one another. It's a big deal. So that's, that's, that's what's unique about the church. So for the first time and only time in history, Jesus created a group whose identifying factor is love for each other. Skin color doesn't matter. Native language doesn't matter. No rules on diet. You could be a Browns and a Steelers fan. The identifying characteristic of a Christian is love for one another is what he's saying. In verse 10 of last week, Jesus told the disciples regarding obedience that the example of obedience was himself. Follow this because it pops up again. Go back to verse 10 of chapter 15 here. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Who's the model? Christ is the model. Now again, we see the same thing telling, Jesus, telling his disciples that he himself is the model. He's the example. This time, with regards to love, he says in, in, uh, in the verse here, in uh, verse 12, at the end of it, that you love one another as I have loved you. I'm the model. So by providing himself as the example, he provides the definition of what love is. Amen? He's the model. Sacrificial. There's, there's multiple ways that we can identify how Christ has loved them. I bring three to you this morning. Um, it's, there's more, but I'll bring three. On. Okay, so Christ says, love, love each other like I loved you. So then the question is, if you really want to obey the commandment, how has he loved us, right? So there's three things that I want to bring to your attention. The first one is that he loved them where they were. Romans 5.8 gives us another perspective on this. Is But God shows his love for us in that while we were still... Yet, sinners, Christ died for us. God shows his love for us in that while we were, he didn't wait for us to get our act together. He loved us where we were at. Amen? I had initially, when I, um, when I, when I was looking at this, I had initially had this first one as unconditional. But I don't like that word, saying that he loved us unconditionally. Because there is a sense where there is a condition. In that, we'll find it here in a minute, he chose us. So there's a condition there. But the point is, he loved us where or them, and us as well, where they're at. And he loves us enough to not leave us there. Amen? Because that's important. Because I think today, in today's culture, people are saying, well, just love. Well, Christ loved. Christ, Christ loved the prostitute, the tax collector. He, he loved them. He loved them right where they're at. Amen. I say the culture stops there. It doesn't continue on to the fact that he doesn't leave us there. Amen. And there's obedience that comes from this, which is what we see here in a couple of verses. You, 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 if you were my friend, you'll keep my commandments type of an idea. There's an obedience that comes. So, but he loves them where he's at. So his grace through the work of the Holy Spirit within the sanctification process caused them, those 11, and us, by extension, not to stay where we're at, but grow in obedience. That's what we see in 14. You are my friends if you do what I command you. They weren't doing what he had commanded prior to him calling them. He loved them where they're at. Second way that we see, we can understand his love is he loves generously. And again, what are we trying to understand? What's the call here? To love my fellow Christian brother or sister the same way he loved me. How did he love me? Well, we just talked about it. He loved us where we're at. Didn't leave us there. So we're to love where, we're, where they're at and be used by him to help grow them out of where they're at. Does that make sense? And the Lord uses us through the power of the Holy Spirit and the sanctification process to do that. So we're to love our Christian brother right where they're at but do the same thing that Christ does with us, doesn't leave us there. By teaching and discipling, that's the whole process that we're called to do. Hence the reason why we're in this room. 
So then the next one is love. He loves us generously. He loved the 11 generously and us through extension. Jesus met the disciples' physical needs throughout his earthly ministry, whether by giving physical food or physical healing. He generously met their needs. So we're to lo love our fellow Christians the same way, generously meet their needs. The early church... We see an example of the early church doing this in Acts 2, where people in Jerusalem were from all over the world. Those who were, who were saved got together and immediately began meeting each other's needs in Acts 2. It says, Acts 2, 44, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Loving generously. Amen? Okay. And then the third one, sacrificially, I think would be a good word to describe it. But Jesus takes the definition of love beyond sharing earthly possessions, food, and even beyond loving people where they're at. And he goes even further with this and loves sacrificially in verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. Jesus declares the greatest form of love, or there is no way greater to prove one's love for a friend than to die for that friend, which is exactly what he's going to be doing. That's what the disciples are getting their heads wrapped around here in John 13, 14, 15. He's going to the cross. So he's saying the apex of love is what you're going to see here in a few short hours. Me on the cross. Laying my life down for my friend. The culmination of Christ's amazing love for his own sheep is his death on the cross, and it is his death on the cross that validates his claim to be the good shepherd because he lays down his life for his sheep. Amen? Now, the disciples he's talking to, except John, they'll walk through this as well. They'll lay down their lives for their friends. Their death does not provide the same form and function as Christ's, of course. But they too will be doing the same things because by proclaiming the message of the gospel, they'll be killed. They're laying their life down for their friends because they're proclaiming the message to their friends. So they're going to be called to walk through the same thing. Of course, again, their death doesn't redeem anyone from sin and death like Christ did. He's is the apex. Before I move on, apex, by the way, Jack, that was a... <laughs> That's for you. First John three sixteen and eighteen, where we will see John again define love. Go to First John real quick. Because he he makes like he brings together John, the same one the Lord used, the Holy Spirit worked through to write the gospel, writes first John. And he brings this idea of sacrificial and generous love together in this passage. 1 John 3, 16. By this we know love. More clarity for us. That he, that's Christ, laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Some are called to physically die. All are called to do what he's about to then make the ap practical application of laying our lives down other than physical death in verse 17. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. So you see sacrificial in 16, practical application of that for those of us who m might not give our physical lives on earth for our friend. The practical application is to meet the needs of those of us. Uh, brothers and sisters around us. Beautiful, isn't it? All right, verse 14 and 15. Go back to John 15. Verse 14 and 15 now, we see uh, the title of friend and then Christ defining friendship. 14, you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. Got to provide clarity on 14. I know you guys know it, but I still got to say it. One doesn't come into a friendship as a result of doing what Jesus commands. 
one does what Jesus commands as a result of coming into a relationship with him. Amen? Because if it was the other way around, it's works-based, we can't earn it. No, it's the fruit that grows from it. If we've been converted, that fruit will grow. And obedience grows over time, like we talked about last week. Growing obedience is a result of authentic faith and growing disobedience is a sign of wrath. Let me say that again. Growing disobedience is a sign of wrath. John 3, 36. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Growing disobedience is the opposite here. Don't let that roll over you. Think about that. Your walk, how's it going? Are you growing in obedience or growing in disobedience? Coming closer, going further away. Horrifying. Verse 15, he calls the eleven servants. Was translated from the Greek word doulos, which could also be translated slave. He says, I no longer call you servants. I no longer call you doulos. No longer call you slaves. So let's pump the brakes here and talk about what that means, right? This, this slave. Now, the meaning of slavery during our time is different than what it meant during Jesus' time. So folks would even sell themselves into slavery. Like if I was a dad with a family and I couldn't provide uh, to meet the needs, basic needs of my family, my wife and kids, I would sell us into slavery. I would go to someone and I would sell us in and our, at least our basic needs would be met. My kids wouldn't starve to death. My wife wouldn't starve to death. So I would sell my family and myself into slavery. However, slaves, once I did that, I would become the property of the one that I would sell myself to, my master. Um, I would be provided for and protected by my master and lived in total submission to my master's will. Now, I wouldn't have an intimate relationship with my master. My master wouldn't tell me what his plans were. My master would say, go and do this. I need you to do this. He wouldn't, I wouldn't have that intimate. He wouldn't explain my, his plans to me as his slave. This is the point here. Jesus is telling his disciples his plans. They're no longer slaves in that meaning because he, they know what he's doing, his master's plans. They're his friends. They enjoy a more intimate relationship with him than a slave would have with his master. The slaves don't know what the master's doing, but these ones, as Jesus' friends, Jesus has disclosed to them what he's doing. What is he doing? He's going to the cross. Even beyond that, he has made known to them what the Father has made known to him. The plan. The cross. A custom from ancient times helps to shed light on this, of the great honor. If, if, you, if you take something away from this morning, please take this away. This is really good. So a custom from back in the day um, that helps to shed light on the great honor that believers have in being friends with the king of the universe. A custom back in ancient times. William Barclay uh, wrote this. He said, the phrase friends was practiced both by Roman emperors and the kings of the Middle East. These palaces, in these palaces, there was a very select group called the friends of the king or the friends of the emperor. At all times, they had access to the king. They even had the right to come to his bedchamber at the beginning of the day. The king or the emperor talked to his friends before he talked to his generals, his rulers, and his statesmen. The friends of the king were those who had the closest and most intimate connection with it's exactly what these 11 have with Jesus as well as us. 
That gives you a perspective from slave to friend. Amen? Beautiful. Last one, 16 through 17. The process and purpose of Christ's love and friendship. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. So the process. How? How did this happen? Very clear. You did not choose me. I chose you. We'll stop right there. The choosing he's talking about here in the first part of 16 is choosing them unto salvation. The process is known as the doctrine of election. They didn't choose him. He sought them out. He chose them. He picked them before the foundations of the world. In Revelation, the book of life will be opened up and there will be names in the book of life. In that text, we learn that those names were written in that book before the earth was even created. He chose them. That's unto salvation. Because the and, look at it. You did not choose me, but I chose you. That's one thing. And there's a second thing here for these, this 11. And appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the 11 disciples. So he says, I chose you. That's salvation. And for these 11, appointed. Because that word appointed is tithemi, and it has the connotation of being set apart for special service. He's talking to the 11, chose unto salvation. And for these 11, tithemi, appointed set aside, separated for special service. There's two things going on with this group. They've been chosen for salvation and they have been set aside, the second thing, uh, for um, special service. Why? So that they would go and bear fruit. Notice that this fruit doesn't wither. Notice that it doesn't die, wither up and die and fade away. What does the fruit do? Abide. Abide. Could it be any clearer? Like we talked last week. Because of the Holy Spirit abiding and living in us, what He calls us for and what He separates us apart to work for Him is to bear fruit that over time grows just like fruit. Not the opposite. Not die and wither away but grow. The sanctification process we talked about yesterday where he's trimming us and he's pruning us. What's the purpose? To grow more. Not to shrink back. Not to grow in disobedience. It's the opposite. So clear. Explains it all. And he reiterates, whatever you ask in the Father's name, he may give it to you. We talked about that over the last couple of weeks. And then he finishes, these things I command, to you, I command you so that you will love one another. What's the point? What's he after? What's the goal? What's the purpose? The purpose of Christ's love and friendship is to love one another. Not unbelievers. We're not talking about unbelievers here. There is a different kind of love that we're to have with Christians. Love them where they're at. And love them to a point where you're not leaving them there because Christ didn't do that with us. Love them generously. Love them sacrificially. Amen? All right, let's pray. Well, let me read the text one more time. Let's pray. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you 
that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. Let's pray. Father, we fail so often at this. And it, it, it doesn't help either, Lord, um, that we know that there are some that preach another Jesus, another gospel from a different spirit that say Jesus, but it's a different Jesus. And it makes it even more difficult to walk through that, to identify. So we need help in that. We need clarity, Lord, as to which ones we are to love like you have loved us and which ones we are to stay away from that are false prophets, false teachers. Um, Lord, I need clarity on that. We need guidance on that. Um, Lord, help us to love our brothers and sisters where they're at and engage in discipleship to not leave them there like you with us. Uh, help us to love generously and sacrificially. Uh, Lord, we desire to be obedient in this command, but know that we need the Holy Spirit to guide us. And we know that he will because that's his purpose, to lead us into these things for your glory as we bear fruit for your glory, Lord. That's what our heart's desire is continue to use this ministry to do that and each individual person in it uh, lord so that you would be glorified and that we would hear you say well done good and faithful servant on that day we love you it's in jesus name we pray amen